another excellent interview from OpenStack Barcelona, OpenStack and Beyond podcast. I'm here with Gaurav from Snapdeal. Um, so tell me a little bit about what you do at Snapdeal and what you guys are doing in the context of OpenStack. All right. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you for the podcast. Um, so I'm VP of Engineering at Snapdeal. Snapdeal is a large e-commerce company in, uh, in India. It's one of the largest uh, marketplaces. And um, what we do with OpenStack, uh, we've just launched a private cloud based on OpenStack. It's uh, one of the uh, top 4% in terms of the size of uh, the total OpenStack deployments uh, in production. Uh, we have over 100,000 cores in production, uh, 16 petabytes of storage, all uh, all managed by OpenStack. So we are very excited uh, with our new public, uh, new private cloud. And we are migrating workloads from our public uh, cloud where we were running earlier onto our new um, uh, private cloud. That sounds like a huge operation. Uh, tell me how you manage and uh, you know develop around such a huge operation, how you roll out services a little bit, the technologies that you guys are using to make it all work. So um, we have a microservices architecture, and yes, we have a very large uh, number of you know uh, services and components running. So its management of them is is a big deal for us, and especially when we were migrating from a public cloud to private cloud, it was very important that we do that using automation. We do that in a way that uh, we are we are sort of uh, 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 the issues don't show up after the migration. So what we did a few things. Uh, first, uh, we automated our complete uh, deployment of applications. Uh, so we've converted them into Chef as a uh, configuration management system, which automatically goes and deploys uh, and installs any service. The second uh, is aspect that we had to uh, work very uh, in detail was that we had to create a service dependency graph of our own applications. So you can imagine 500 services talking to each other it's not an easy thing for us uh, to sort of uh, migrate one at a time. So we had to understand how they're interacting with each other. And we created a service dependency graph, and then we created service groups and migrated the groups uh, in, in, in one go. So, um, so we, we did all of that. Uh, secondly, uh, we have uh, created a layer on top of OpenStack for our orchestration, which is uh, using Terraform. And we've, um, we've added um, all our, we have defined all our applications as blueprints in a YAML files, where you where we define, you know, uh, not only like what is the application, where it should run, but also things like where, uh, where is, what's the Git repository from the from which the application code should come from, how many minimum instances, maximum in instances do you need to run so that we always keep track of, uh, you know, how you know how the application is doing, and also the dependency graph of okay, which application, which port does it need to talk to, so that when we uh, create that application in OpenStack or any public cloud, we are able to control the security groups and everything, and we only open the ports that, that the application should be s supposed to talk to. So all of that is written in blueprints and, and infrastructure as code that, um, that we create, and then using Terraform, we are able to then orchestrate that in OpenStack cloud or a public cloud. Yeah, so we do something very similar, actually. That's funny. Um, so Terraform is mostly infrastructure level. So, I'm, so I understand that you guys kind of wrote your own code for the full lifecycle orchestration of it um, to get to the next level. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so we use Terraform for the infrastructure, like you said, infrastructure orchestration. And what it does in, in a nutshell is it, un it reads that YAML file and it goes and creates those virtual machines. Then uh, it sort of gives the control back to our code which goes to, uh, again, look at those YAML files and blueprints to find out, okay, what do I need to install on this? Okay, I need to install a Java uh, you know, sort of application, and this is where the code is going to be. And it goes and builds that code in a CI CD pipeline, and then it in, uh, brings up that uh, you know, jar file or what sort of RPM onto that machine and installs it. Uh, that's just one part of it. But then let's say you have a dependency on a MySQL or a dependency on a Mongo or something else. It goes and then interprets that, that is that dependency something that I have to create brand new, or is it dependency something that already exists? And then it con it connects those things as well. So that part is completely our code. So microservices is from another one of those buzzwords uh, that people are, are talking about. Um, are you guys using containers and uh, in the context of microservices, or are you just doing this on VMs or bare metal? And um, if you are, you know, what technologies are you using for that? So uh, microservices are not a buzzword for us. It's what we live and breathe every day. Uh, like I was saying, that we have more than 500 microservices running, and each microservice for us is a is a, a multi-tier application. It's a bunch of web servers that have databases, that have connections to uh, you know, message queues. So, so imagine that you know 500 times what, whatever uh, n-tier applications that you can have. That's how much how many services we manage. So it's absolutely uh, part of our architecture. 
So um, the second part is uh, um, that how do we, uh, so, so what was the second question? I asked if you guys are doing anything in the context of oh containers yeah. to, to manage your microservices. Yeah, so containers is the next uh, uh, you know, sort of, I, I wouldn't say buzzword, but that's, an, that's a new technology that everybody's super excited about. Uh, we are not using containers right now, uh, and there's a reason for that, because we have, uh, containers are uh, so far very good with stateless kind of applications. Uh, and we can use them for our web servers, absolutely. I don't see any problem doing that. In, yeah, but what about, I mean, we have tons of databases, uh, and for that, we are, uh, containers are not ready, plus their, their networking is not as mature as what we use. We use uh, SDN capabilities pretty heavily. Uh, our storage is all network storage, um, because you know we have a highly scalable uh, storage um, you know, sort of infrastructure. So I don't see a reason right now f immediately for us to jump into containers, but we would let we would keep an eye on how these things are maturing, and maybe you know uh, next year we'll, we'll we'll try some things out. Uh, we are doing a little bit of containers on the development side. There's a developer VMs where they want a, you know very contained environment, uh, but we have made the virtual machine creation very very simple. And, uh, and very fast, so we really, and we automated the entire life cycle that containers solve. So pretty much we are, we are able to achieve what containers offer with our life cycle management that we've created. Yeah, we've heard that a lot around microservices with the stateful and stateless uh, you know, uh, applications uh, alongside each other. That's what we talk about when we talk about the hybrid stack. We have some stuff in containers, some stuff on virtualized, non-virtualized uh, you know, infrastructure, and uh, orchestrating that whole operation has become a real complex uh, story. But um, I think that uh, the microservices story doesn't um, end with just the infrastructure or the technology. I mean, teams need to be engineered um, around uh, microservices, you know, kind of loosely coupled, they say. You have to build uh, your whole... Uh, you know, team and culture and philosophy around that. So tell me a little bit about that. Absolutely true. Um, so we have, um, you know, close to 1,000 engineers who are working on, uh, you know, different kinds of, different parts of our, uh, our product. And microservices gives you the flexibility that now you can, um, you know, build and deploy something really fast uh, without uh, a lot of dependency on the other components. So that definitely makes the whole development process very agile, very swift. But it does create the problem that you're talking about, that how do you coordinate, how do you maintain the quality in SLA. So what we've done in Snapdeal is uh, we have um, you know, very strict policies around what are the SLAs that a microservices has to offer. And this goes in very loose terms on, say, for example, the latency that uh, is, is uh, ex uh, expected from the uh, service that's calling you. So you have to main, make sure that you know 99th percentile or 90th percentile of your, of your requests are going to return in so much latency. Second thing is we have very clean definitions of APIs that you expose. Um, I can hold that. I'm sure your hand's tired. <laughs> uh, so uh, what we do is that whenever you write a microservice, uh, you have to expose a certain API, and that's documented ahead of time so that the colleague service are is able to maintain, uh, you know, make the code change accordingly. And the third and the, and the most important thing is backward compatibility. You, I mean, we have very strict uh, requirements about back, not breaking backward compatibility. And if you're ever deprecating an API, you have to make sure that all your poly, uh, uh, applications are notified in advance so that you can make those changes. And uh, even on the testing side, we what we do have, we have multiple stages of, of testing. We have you know development testing, which is just functional testing and unit testing. But then the code uh, moves from there to an integration test environment, which is fully automated, again, using our orchestration, where you have all the components available, all the different kind of versions available, and then automated tests are run to, to make sure that no, no intercompatibility is not broken. Then we have a pre-staging environment, and then we go to production. So, yeah. So you touched on a few things that are interesting to me in the context of microservices. Um, uh, first of all, about like services and breaking services on purpose, chaos monkey, things like that. How do you test your services to make sure that, you know, uh, for downtime, things like that? And also eventual consistency is also uh, an issue that uh, I know is a, a s can be an issue around microservices. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, well, we create enough chaos in the infrastructure ourselves so that we don't need chaos monkeys. <laughs> we, we, we have very uh, aggressive development cycles. We, we release multiple times, in a, in a, you know, sometimes in a day, multiple times in a week. So uh, since the development cycles are, are very fast for the applications itself, we don't really rely on you know, chaos monkeys kind of app, uh, you know, uh, methods. We rely on our um, automation tests to be you know, robust enough to catch most of the things in, develop, in development and test environments. For an infrastructure side of things, we are absolutely thinking about making everything redundant and testing uh, those redundancy in, uh, in production. For example, uh, one of the tests that we did in our uh, dev and test OpenStack cluster is we, uh, we shut down the control plane completely. And we wanted to see that, okay, as the OpenStack data plane stays alive, then the control plane is completely dead. 
and we also have added multiple layers of redundancy in, in let's say, our routers and switches and, and even NIC cards. So at every layer, we, we, we made sure that we, have re we are redundant. Even on the cluster side, that whenever we have a data cluster of any kind, let's say uh, uh, an Aerospike or a Cassandra cluster or a MySQL cluster, we deliberately will test that, okay, if a node goes down, how, how, what, will, what will be the impact on performance when the rebalancing of the cluster is happening? Uh, one very, very important thing that we take care about when we are launching clustered applications is we give them anti-affinity for a different level. So we have a concept of pods in our data center. Uh, each pod has three racks in it. And of course, each rack will have multiple servers. So when you're launching a clustered application, let's say you want to launch a six node clustered MySQL or Mongo or anything, uh, the orchestration uh, software will understand and first of all, try to place it across different pods so that the failure domain is a pod. Uh, if you're launching very large clusters and, for example, some pods are not available, it is going to make sure that it is uh, at least spread across different racks and different servers at least. We don't launch uh, uh, a clustered application where two nodes of the same cluster lives on the same host. Uh, that's completely no, the, the command fails and you have to manually intervene. So those are certain things that we are doing for redundancy. You had a question about data consistency. Yeah. I, I, I didn't quite understand what, what that uh, sort of what. Uh, no, just uh, in, in terms of the uh, microservices and each one are being, you know, and when it writes da data and sometimes, you know, it, real time aspects of, uh, you know, an organization like Snapdeal, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah so that's just. Uh, so we, we solve it in a, in a very uh, different way. We, because of it's a microservice, it basically owns its own data. Uh, which, w like I was explaining earlier, so a microservice is a, is a Tomcat layer and, and, and a dedicated database layer. So nobody else sort of writes to the database except this microservice. So it's pretty much the owner of the data. Mm -hmm. So that maintains the data consistency. If somebody else wants to access this data, they have to go through this microservice and this microservice has to expose APIs to access it. So somebody, let's say A is talking to B and B is writing some data and A wants to write something, they need to call that API of B to write. Uh, what and some every time microservices run into trouble when uh, there are services which are directly accessing the database and start writing to it, that does create data consistency issue because you are an application and you don't know the data is changing underneath you. So we try to avoid that completely by making sure that data is com is tightly coupled with the application, the microservice application. Um, so what do you think of where uh, OpenStack is going? Where would you like to see OpenStack go? It sounds almost like you guys are doing what Netflix are doing with AWS on OpenStack. It sounds like really cutting edge, and I, this is possibly the first story I've heard of uh, you know such a large scale microservices operation on OpenStack in production. Uh, really, really interesting. Um, so where do you see OpenStack going in the context of microservices and and being kind of uh, you know a leader in that space? I, I haven't heard uh, as much around OpenStack in this uh, space. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, yeah, I mean. We're very excited uh, that we have launched, uh, you know, our new private cloud with OpenStack. I feel that OpenStack is uh, mature enough now to run production workloads of all kinds, uh, and, uh, and our kind of transactional workload and in an e-commerce space was definitely one of the f first ones that has come on OpenStack. But so far, we've seen that uh, the OpenStack as a uh, infrastructure software has held up pretty well for us. It is performing. Uh, we are adding the capabilities that we are that we need for our orchestration on top of it, and it's flexible enough, and it has enough APIs and uh, you know uh, uh, methods for us to program it the way we want it. So, so we are very excited and satisfied with OpenStack, and we would love to sort of uh, contribute back and, and share our story more with the community. And this is this is a start. Awesome! Thank you so much for sharing your story. We're definitely going to bring you in uh, for more uh, podcast uh, activities. Uh, I thought this was a great story. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Excellent.